We all know dogs smell a kajillion times better than us, but in this video, I really wanna take a deep dive on the science behind how your dog's nose works. And I really wanna establish how his sniffer is affecting his anxiety. See, what information your dog consumes through his nose can actually make his anxiety better or worse. And so in this video, I'm gonna be not only establishing the science of what we know how your dog smells, but I also wanna give you some tactful strategies that you can use to make sure that your dog is using his nose in a way that's going to benefit him and help him feel more confident. If you're interested in learning all that information, keep watching. What's up guys, it's Jenna with Dog Liaison where I coach you on how to enhance your dog's mental health on this channel, we break down scientific research in order to inform us on how to train dogs. In my signature program, the Recovering Rover Program for Anxious Dogs, I work with exclusively dogs facing multiple anxiety related disorders. One of the formulas that I teach my clients is called the Dog Breed Self Method, which is unique to me, but it is a way for us to make sure we are meeting all of our dog's needs and that we are making them live a confident, holistically happy life. One of the ways that we meet our dog's needs is by making sure that they are using their nose. But it's not just enough to say, hey, go walk out your dog and make sure that they sniff a couple things. That's really an overgeneralization and an oversimplification. Instead, what we really wanna make sure is we understand how their sniffer is working and that it is creating a positive association which is benefiting them, which is making sure that they are going to have a confident experience out in the world. For starters, there has been a lot of research on the dog's nose. We know a lot about it. And for a full introduction on what dogs can smell, I really recommend watching Dr. Alexander Horowitz's TED Talk, which I'll link right here. It acts as an excellent introduction to what dogs can smell. But in this video, I really want to establish a deeper dive on that and kind of pick specifically how it pertains to your dog's anxiety. For example, we know that a dog can smell the age of another dog or person, the sex of another dog, when that other dog last ate or went to the restroom. They can smell the upcoming weather, the way afternoon smells and whether you are sick or upset. Every inhaled gulp is full of information. It holds the odors of people who have recently passed by. It catches pollen and plant notes, traces of animals. And we know that dogs can smell at a great distance from many, many miles away, especially if there's a breeze. So why then do dogs insist on putting their nose to the ground? Well, as Dr. Hart Horowitz puts it in her book. She says that it's like when you go up to a painting and you have to get really close up to it to look at all of the intricacies. See, when a dog is putting their nose to the ground, what they're actually doing is deciphering the smells. They're not just like consuming them. They're trying to orient them and put them in a bunch of different categories. And so it's like if you're looking at a painting, you want to see how all of the different colors blend and how they all separate them. And you want to look at all of the nuances. That's what your dog is doing the closer their nose gets to that scent. We also know that dogs can tell time. So in a 2011 paper, it was established that dogs are gauging the time based off of how long it's been since the odor has been in the environment. So for example, you being existing in your room, in your house, is creating a very strong odor. And the longer you are gone, the more that odor is going to deteriorate, which informs the dogs that time has gone and they memorize what that odor is going to smell like by the time you walk in. And so you always hear the tells of like, oh, my dog knows when I'm gonna come home, he just knows when it's five o'clock. He's able to predict that based off of how long your odor has been out of the environment. It's also been established that dogs can smell mood and emotions. And they do this for dogs and other people. So for example, they can tell when another dog is stressed or when another dog is fearful. And they can also tell when you are stressed or you're fearful. And they're doing this based off of the pheromones that you emit. So for example, a lot of times you hear, oh, you're just emitting an energy and that's why your dog is behaving this way because you're emitting that you're not confident or your energy is saying that you're fearful or whatever. And it gets very vague around this like whole energy word. What's actually happening is that you're emitting a certain pheromone, a certain odor. And more specifically, your dog is identifying that the odor has shifted, that there is a new scent, but whether or not they're able to interpret it as like the stress odor or the happy odor comes later. And they do this through patterns. So when you first emit a happy odor, they're not gonna all of a sudden go, oh, that's the odor that means mom's happy. They're gonna look for patterns. When does this odor occur? Well, this odor occurs when, you know, we're playing outside and throwing fetch. 
This odor occurs when we're sitting on the couch and getting belly rubs. If you emit the fearful or the stressed pheromone, then your dog is going to look for the pattern. When does this odor occur? Oh, this odor occurs when we go out for walks. Oh, this odor occurs when I growl, right? They're gonna look for trends to establish when do these odors occur and that's how they create associations with them. This is good and bad. It's good because your dog is getting to know your mood and it's a, it's a way to, for you to bond, right? In the same way that we understand their mood based off of their behavior, they're able to understand our mood based off of our scent. It's a good thing. It's bad because they can actually use these odors as cues. So for example, if one of the reasons why you're getting stressed on walks is because you're anxious about your dog encountering a trigger and you're worried that he's gonna go over threshold and he's gonna bark and he's gonna growl, or if you're worried about your dog at the vet because you know that it's gonna be a hefty bill or whatever and you're getting anxious about that, and that's when your dog starts smelling this odor in these events, then they're gonna use that scent as a way to predict what event is occurring. They go, oh, mom is emitting this odor, that means that we're probably gonna go for a walk and we're gonna encounter our triggers. Or, oh, last time mom emitted this odor, it happened when they were at the vent. And so they start creating associations with these odors based off of prior experience. And this is can be very detrimental for the anxious dog. This is one of the things I was talking about at the beginning, which is our dog sniffer can actually be to their anxiety's detriment. It can actually be one of the ways that they anticipate bad things are going to happen. Another example of this is weather. So a lot of dogs that have anxiety get very anxious when there's a rainstorm coming or when there's a thunder. And they will start to anticipate, oh, thunder is occurring based off of how trees smell, based off of how streets smell. They're able to predict the weather several days in advance. And so if your dog has a history of not enjoying certain weather, that can be a bad thing. If on the other hand, you have a history of every single time the weather's bad, you don't have to go to work, and you get to stay home with your dog for three days because the weather's bad, well then the weather change has a positive association. And as soon as your dog smells it, he's gonna go, oh, in a couple days, mom gets to stay home with me and she's not gonna have to go to work. So they use these scents as information to predict what's going to happen next. If what they're predicting next is something that they like, then it has a positive association. If what they're predicting is coming next is gonna be something they don't like, that's when you get a lot of anxious behavior that is undesirable. Now it's reasonable to believe that certain breeds would be better at sniffing than others, right? We think of like our bloodhounds or the stereotypical scent hounds. And we think that, okay, those dogs have some magical superpower that makes them that much better at smelling. That's why they do those jobs, right? And this is actually what researchers hypothesized in 2020, that these breeds just infrastructurally are better equipped to sniff. That was the hypothesis. But when they looked at 103 skulls over 43 breeds, this is not what they found. They actually found that anatomically, all the breeds are within the same realm. There was no statistical difference between them. And so what this really means is that everybody has the same capacity anatomically to smell the exact same. However, when they compared the 43 domesticated dog breed skulls to the ancestral gray wolf and coyote, there was a very statistical difference. And so what this demonstrates is that an evolution has occurred between the gray wolf and the domesticated dog, an evolution has occurred. And what this really means is that anatomically, domesticated dogs are not equipped to be able to smell at the farthest distance that a coyote and especially a gray wolf can. Now, why would this be? Well, it's hypothesized that it's because they just would not need to smell that far. If a dog is living with humans and humans are predictably giving them food, they're not gonna have to go search for food. They're certainly not gonna have to look very far for food. There's no reason for them to have to smell at miles and miles and miles far away like a gray wolf would because they're not hunting necessarily. What we know from this is that yes, an evolution has taken place and yes, we see that domestication has played a role in that evolution and as a result, our dogs are not smelling as good as they could have 14,000 years ago. However, comparatively, they still got smells at the yin yang and comparatively, they can all anatomically sniff equivalently. So if all 
breeds are anatomically and structurally established the same. Why then is it so clear that certain breeds are more prone to put their nose to the ground? Why then is it so clear that there are certain breeds that make better trackers than other? Well, this really comes down to our human intervention. What this means for your anxious dog is that likely your anxious dog is not putting his nose to the ground or is putting his nose to the ground a lot as a result of human intervention. Whether or not that's directly your intervention, that remains to be seen. We're gonna talk about that. But for starters, us constantly asking our dogs to walk by our side and not have their nose to the ground and to be at attention is automatically removing their ability to sniff, okay? And it is automatically affecting their evolution. Ironically though, it's okay in our minds for certain breeds to do that. Ironically, when we have a scent breed, those dogs are permitted to put their nose to the ground a whole lot more. And in fact, they are selected for their ability to put their nose to the ground. Whereas other breeds, are selected for their ability to walk by your side at a perfect heel without putting their nose to the ground. And so what we've actually done is through artificial selection, we've been selecting dogs on a cognitive level. We've been asking for dogs that choose not to behaviorally demonstrate that sniffing and then other breeds who choose to behaviorally demonstrate that sniffing. So whether or not they are actually capable of it is irrelevant. It's a matter of are they choosing to, are they permitted to demonstrate that ability? What has occurred is that we have conditioned our dogs to remove sniffing from their repertoire in many cases. Now, there is this sort of revolution in the last couple of years, which is like, let the dog sniff. And that's all true. But for me, there needs to be a second part to that. Yes, we need to let the dog sniff, but we also need to be aware of what associations are being created when the dogs do sniff. And so what this means is that we actually need to be making sure that not only is he putting his nose to the ground, not only is that information going through his olfactory system, but it's actually accessing the parts of his brain in a way that we want it to. And it's creating the positive associations in the way that we want it to. When your dog consumes information, it goes through his nose, yes, but then one of the things it actually does is it finds the amygdala and the hippocampus. The amygdala is in charge of the fight, flight, or freeze, system, the hippocampus is in charge of memories, the whole section is in charge of emotions and feelings and pheromones, okay? So when that occurs, he's consuming the information and he's creating an association with it as soon as it enters his brain. He's creating a little picture in the same way that when you smell a certain candle, you think of your grandmother. Or in the same way that if you lay on your partner's pillow, you can smell them, right? You're creating a certain association with that scent and it's bringing up an image in your head. The same is true for the dogs. Okay? And so what we need to make sure is that when they're consuming that information, the picture, the memory, the emotion that they are creating as a result of that scent is something that we like. Otherwise, it's going to be anxiety inducing. Now here are some actionable steps that you can take to make sure that the information your dog is consuming through his nose results in a positive association that you like. For example, I love, love, love making scents a cue and you can do this with candles. One of the things that I always recommend is using a candle when you're practicing a relaxation protocol or when you're relaxing on the couch and it's time to wind down. Use that association of that specific scent to relaxation time. That's one of my favorite things to do. Another thing that you can do is yes, letting them sniff on walks. But one of the things I actually recommend you do is try when you're on your walk to predict what your dog is gonna wanna stop and sniff. This is really fun actually, because at the beginning you're gonna be wrong a couple of times, but you're going to, on your walk, you're gonna be very mindful. You're not gonna be oblivious to the walk. You're gonna be very aware of your walk. You're gonna be sitting in that presence and you're going to be thinking about, oh, I see a fire hydrant up there. I'm going to predict that my dog's gonna to wanna to sniff it or even mark it. Oh, there is a bundle of trees over there. I bet he's gonna to want to sniff that. You know, I want you to start guessing what you think your dog is gonna to wanna to sniff, and this will be actually very informative for you. As opposed to you just, oh, I'm just blindly letting him think about things. You're actually taking an active role and letting him tell you what sniffs what smells are important and which are not. Now food puzzles are also really great sniffing opportunities, but I wanna talk about this for a second because generally people will just say, you know, pop a makeshift food puzzle down and let your dog have at it. In fact, I have two videos right here that give examples on how to create food puzzles and I definitely recommend checking those out. But when you have an anxious dog, you can't just 
pull a food puzzle option off of the internet and give it to your dog and see what works. And the reason is because many of our anxious dogs are dealing with some insecurity and they may not have the motivation or even the ability to problem solve. And what this really means is that when you give your dog something to sniff, when you give your dog that food puzzle, make sure that the success rate is very high. Make sure that your dog is getting more success, reaping more rewards as a result of his hunt than not. Then once he's invested in the game, you can afford to raise that criteria and then you can start to say, I want you to really hunt for this food before you find it. And remember that the hunt, the seeking part is the dopamine kick, not the finding. Once they find the food, they eat it, that's true. But the dopamine kick is actually occurring when they're seeking it out. And so you wanna make sure that as your dog gets more confident, as your dog enjoys this game more, whatever game you're giving your dog, you're actually elongating the seeking part of it, not necessarily elongating or enriching the finding part of it. Like it's not a matter of quantity of food, it's a matter of quality of search. That's how you wanna think of it. When we're thinking about whether or not our dog is actually enjoying it, one of the ways you can gauge progress is how long they're willing to invest in the hunt. The longer they're willing to stay on that track, invest their energy in the hunt, the more reinforcing it is. Finally, I recommend nose work classes as well to help your dog. These are fun classes for your dog to take. The one thing I will say is that obedience is not beneficial to nose work. Obedience actually is the antithesis of nose work. The goal with nose work is to get our dogs working independent of us. And yes, you are there, but you're not really playing an active role in the equation. Your dog is hunting and seeking on his own. Whereas with obedience, the dog's default is always to check in with the guardian. From a nose work perspective, and in fact, from my own personal perspective, it actually is sad when I see a dog that doesn't know how to make any decisions or even use his sniffer without his who man's consent and control. That's not enriching. That's not what we want for our anxious dogs. We want our anxious dogs problem solving. We want them seeking. We want them enjoying using their noses and ensuring that the information that comes through their noses is creating a positive association, a positive emotion, a part of it. If you enjoyed this video, do me a favor, smash that like button, consider subscribing, hit the notification bell so you get notified when I drop a new video. Make sure you check out these two videos next and I'll see you guys next time.